Okay, welcome everyone. Tonight we are going to hear about a seed conservation safari with Sephra Alexandra, the seed huntress. Uh, we're going to learn how seeds are saved in global seed banks, in living seed banks, that would be the soil, and in local seed libraries. Granby Public Library, the Granby Agricultural Commission, and the Granby Land Trust are pleased to welcome Sephra Alexandra, the seed huntress. She's an ethnobotanist on an endurance race to preserve the biodiversity of our wild and cultivated lands through seed conservation. This is exciting. Um, she also leads the Ecotype Project to amplify the amount of truly local native seed available for ecological restoration. Um, she's created the first ecoregional seed supply chain in the Northeast, United States of America. In 2020, Sephra began botanical.org, that's B-O-A-T, capital B-O-A-T, um, anical.org, where she guides expeditions that are, quote, paddling for the pollinators, like that, um, planting native plants by boat. Um, and then let's see, she holds her M-A-T and agroecological education from Cornell University. And she is a fellow of the Global Crop Diversity Trust a Wings World Quest Expedition flag carrier, a member of the Explorers Club, and runs a wilderness skills school, the Readiness Collective, with her twin brother. So that sounds like a fantastic life. That is a life well lived. And so now we're going to give our official warm welcome to Sephra Alexandra, the Seed Huntress. Welcome. Thanks, Holly. And hello to all you Grandians. I don't know if that's a real word or not, <laughs> but um, I'm delighted to be here. And I am going to cover a lot of material, so I am grateful that this will be recorded because oftentimes I think people need to watch my presentation a few times to really um, absorb. But what I really want to do as we go on this seed conservation safari, as I say, I have this great safari tent in the wilds of South Norwalk, Connecticut. So I am a Connecticut, proud to be on the unceded lands of the Bogosset Golden Hill tribe. Um, you know, this land is known as Matchmux, the beautiful land, and truly the way that it was caretaken and stewarded since time immemorial, um, all the native plants, the nut trees, all of the life that happens uh, in the sound and in the forest. It's an honor to be doing this work and to be working in seed conservation. And what I want to paint for you all tonight is how seed conservation works on an international level, a national level, and a local level, because um, there are different strategies that are utilized. And I've worked amongst many different types of them. And so hopefully this will help illustrate all of that for you. And then, yes, please put questions in the chat and we should hopefully have about 10 minutes at the end where we can um, go over some of those. So this first image um, is when I was doing field work in the South Pacific for the Crop Trust for a beautiful crop called taro, but we'll get to that in a bit. So I wanna start by saying that, yes, I call myself the seed huntress on the hunt to preserve the biodiversity of our earth through seed. And um, it's really a great privilege to work with seed because they are the greatest manifestations, the most elegant design, the most simplistic, when you take all of nature's bounty and biodiversity, they they're all put into these tiny little living embryos. Seeds are alive, right? A, a, a small acorn can grow a mighty oak. And um, these seeds, they're the lineage between all of our ancestors, all those that have come before us and all those that come after. And not just for us, but for the birds and the butterflies and the raccoons and for everyone. So they really hold a story and there's so much reverence that I have for seeds and talk about art. This is Seed Time Capsules of Life, a beautiful book. I don't know if the Granby Public Libraries have it, but it is just amazing. It looks like the truffle trees. And so it's really fun to kind of zoom in. So to give a frame of reference, Nikolai Vavilov was one of the first Russian ethnobotanists. An ethnobotanist is someone that studies the relationship between plants and people. And he was in Russia and he said, you want to know what? These seeds are really important. We need to start safeguarding them because between man-made and natural disasters, we're starting to lose them in different areas of the world. And he was really the first person that went and traveled to all these different areas of the world and cataloged what species were actually growing there 
there and started to bring back seeds from those different places. What he formed from that is what's known as centers of origin, where the crops first emerge in our earth is where they have greatest centers of diversity, maize and wheat in Mexico, pulses and grains in India. Um, you can start to look at our, at our world through the lens of crop diversity. So from that, perhaps some of you have heard about Svalbard, the global seed vault, sometimes called the doomsday vault. And what that is, is that is a backup repository for all of those different countries to back up their agricultural crop seeds. So um, each of the different countries take their main field crops and they send in a box in these little mylar envelopes, uh, um, not too many seeds, but um, maybe 50 to 200 seeds of each species. So like in Syria, when they experienced civil unrest and their seed bank was bombed, if there wasn't a backup of their heritage grains, then they wouldn't be able to replant their fields and they would have lost all of those genetics that have adapted um, to those arid areas and have all those beautiful taste profiles. And so what this does is this allows a backup that only the countries that put those seeds there are allowed to take them back out. So that's how our global seed vault works. Now, the seed vault is the top of the pyramid, um, just as I showed you off of Nikolai Vavilov's centers of origin. These little circles here show you where our um, 12, and now it's 13, of our world's main seed banks, right? So um, being that orthodox seed, orthodox seed means that seed, if you think about your tomatoes and your peppers, the ones that you can dry out and that you could store in a cool, dark, dry place. Very cold in these instances. So you can see the center for maize and wheat, over 150,000 varieties is held in Mexico. You have the agroforestry um, crop tree species in Kenya. And where I was sent as a fellow of the Global Crop Diversity Trust that manages that seed, that um, Svalbard Global Seed Vault was to, I know, poor me, Fiji. And that was the um, uh, CPAC, which is the C Center for Pacific Crops and Trees. Uh, I think there's two people in the waiting room. I don't know if I can let them in. Okay, so um, here is, Taro, which is Colocasia esculenta. And perhaps some of you have had poi if you visited Hawaii or maybe even bubble tea. It's those little bubbles at the bottom of it. But taro is the 14th most eaten vegetable in the world. And in Samoa in 1994, they experienced the taro leaf light. And so this staple food crop, um, which is, I actually got to see a king coronated doing field work in the Cook Islands. This is not some staged event. This was a real, a real event of a new king being coronated. Um, taro is a plant that's given in rituals and ceremonies of birth, life, death, um, weddings. It's a staple food crop and such a, a key uh, cultural totem. So in um, 1994, when this blight came through and wiped all of the taro out, it had huge impact on, um, I'm gonna keep talking while I play this video. I'm gonna share my slides with you all, everyone who comes here. And these videos are also all linked on my website. Um, but, uh, oh, that didn't work. So maybe I'll turn this sound off. So what I did in an effort to share my field work is I made this cartoon version of what I did so people can understand the tale of taro leaf blight. So what happened, was this leaf blight comes through and kills all the crops. So these ethnobotanists end up going back out to the centers of origin of where taro existed to rebreed a blight resistant variety of taro. And once they were able to do that, it took 10 years, they were able to repopulate the fields. And that's what started the seed bank, the center for taro where I was working. So this video goes on to show, you can see this global map after that blight resistant taro was safeguarded in the seed bank in Fiji, when Nigeria in 2012 faced the same blight, they were allowed, um, they could immediately deploy those new strains that were blight resistant. And so that could stave off famine, huge economic impacts and so forth. So that's why it's so important to maintain these huge arcs of diversity in our seed banks, because you never know which blight or what way the climate will shift and so forth. And the diversity among seeds is, the painter's palette of breeders. And without that, we really can't adapt to whatever we may face. So that's how um, our world 
ex situ. So ex situ is the fancy Latin word for away from place. So the cold storage banks work. What we'll talk about later is in situ, which just means in the soil, in place. Hey, so Sephra, now, oh, Sephra, I'm sorry for yep. the quick interruption. We yes. got a little bit of a gray, dark gray hatched, uh, thatched box on the right-hand side of our slides, which is obscuring your slides just a little bit. Do we know if we can get rid of that? Yeah, oh, there you are. Oh. There it is, oh, there it goes. Oh, oh is that, did I did I fix it? Um, You made it smaller, it's in the upper right now. Oh, that's just the box that shows you and people talking. Maybe if I go like that, how's that? Can you, that's even better, we like that. Okay, I can't see me or any of you, but hopefully that's, you all. That's good. That. That's that's a huge improvement. We're happy there. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, and uh, let's let's keep rolling. Okay, so now we roll into this is Haiti. So we're still on an international scale, and my twin brother Jesse and I run a business called Tactivate, which does disaster response, and he does logistics and operations. Um, and I come at it from a food security side. So what happens in these subsistence farming nations, especially island nations, when a hurricane washes through or whips through is their fields are completely denuded of all their crops. And in these countries, that's what they rely on for their sustenance, for again, their economics. It's the only way that, you know, oftentimes they're able to make money and feed their family. So it's a huge problem. And what, happen, what happens with the really well-intentioned NGOs is they come in and they'll bring in seed, let's say grown in North Carolina, North Carolina rice, which in Haiti they call Miami rice. Now, even though that's well-intentioned, it does a few things. One, it's not viable seed. That rice has no idea how to grow in Haiti because it's been grown in a completely different climate. Two, it can bring in pests, which can actually be very detrimental um, in terms of an agroeconomic setting. And it also undercuts the economy of farmers up in Northern Haiti that might still have rice because now everyone's relying on the free rice. So a much better method and module is to uh, create what's known as a community seed bank. So if you think about those large scale um, international seed banks, now we're looking at the community level so that when your fields are wiped out from seed, you have a resource right within your community to replant your fields with that bioregionally adapted seed, seed that has grown in your soils forever, that you've stewarded, that you know the taste of. And so what you're able to do is access that seed immediately after a disaster to immediately replant your fields. It's a uh, regenerative, self-maintaining, self-perpetuating, self-regulating model of disaster response that um, is really crucial in these types of events. So this is the agronome Ilie Saint Magloire, who um, I was fortunate enough to work with, and I worked to fortify a seed bank down in, in the southern department of Haiti. And he oversees 25 farm managers who then consult with um, over 2,500 smaller hold farmers. So if he has a repository of that seed, they're able to disperse it readily. So again, on my website um, is a great video that we made of our field work down there. And you can see some beautiful drone shots. Haiti is such a gorgeous country that unfortunately faces both man-made and natural disasters more frequently than many other places. Um, the predominant crop we've been safeguarding is castor. We were able to start a female-led castor seed oil cooperative so that they can have their own funds to be able to pay for continuing and ongoing maintenance of the seed bank. Because what you don't want to do is build something that takes a lot of maintenance without any mechanism um, to you know, financially help perpetuate that once kind of after these disasters happen and everyone leaves and the funds dry up. So we really want to make it something that they can maintain themselves through a, a closed loop permaculture and financial model, if you were. Um, okay, I know we're going fast on the safari, but now we find ourselves back in the United States. So we've talked about how our agricultural, how our agricultural crops are safeguarded, but 
how are our wild species safeguarded, right? Because we have all those beautiful wildflowers. You can see in that upper corner, I'm um, scouting Primula alkylina, which is this beautiful plant that grows along bubbling brooks in Idaho. And we would also go look for Draba hitchcockii, which only grows, you know, miles into the wilderness on these rock faces in the greatest rattlesnake territory in the country. And when my dad heard I was, you know, duct taping cardboard to my legs, he was not impressed and set me out proper snake gators. But, um, you know, for someone who loves the wilderness and loves seeds and loves plants, getting to truly be a seed huntress and go out and find these rare plants to safeguard them is such a privilege. Um, so we follow what's known as the seeds of success protocols. And that makes sure that you're not taking too much of a wild population because you want that population to persist in the wild that um, you're making sure that you take herbaria, so dried plant species and submitting it to the Smithsonian and all the proper institutions and that you're provenancing, that you're taking that really important data about where it's located, the type of soil it's in and so forth. Now these seeds are all safeguarded as what's known as the Millennium Seed Bank. This is kind of the Mecca of the botanical world um, at Kew. So it's at Wakehurst, which is right near about an hour from Kew Gardens in, in England. Um, you can see down in that bottom, uh, it's on my left hand, I think it should be on yours as well. Um, that's the Millennium Seed Bank. So that's where our wild species are saved globally. Okay, so now we are finally back in Connecticut. And this is a beautiful shot of the founder plots of the Ecotype Project. Now, after all this work I've done with different um, agro agricultural crops, horticultural crops, now I come to native seeds. And we all have kind of heard about issues with our pollinators. You know, pollinators have no habitat. They have no food. They're, you know, our lawns are denuded of all of the wild biodiversity. We've, we're you know, fragmenting our last wild corridors. And, you know, not, not to present doom and gloom, but really I wanna focus on the solution. And the solution is we need truly local native wild seed. So when I came back, I joined um, with CT NOFA, which is the Northeast Organic Farming Association. So why is a farming association uh, worried about pollinators? Well, you can see on the right, those blueberries have been properly pollinated. And if you look on the left, those have not been. So as our executive director, Dina Brewster says, it's really the pollinators that are paying our paycheck. So if we don't have food and housing for them, well, friends, we don't have local food security either. So what we need to do now, now is kind of we've geographically located ourselves with the other endeavors that I've um, have talked to you about. Now we are looking at an eco-regional framework. So the EPA, um, when they were working uh, for conservation and restoration, you have hydrologists, water scientists, you have um, agroforestry folks, you have ornithologists, you have all these disparate scientists that kind of work off slightly different data sets. And uh, if you truly want to be doing conservation and restoration, we can't be using these man-made delineations of here's where Connecticut ends and begins and here's where Massachusetts ends and begins. We needed a more ecological framework. So this wonderful gentleman, James Obernick at the EPA, helped to champion and has written great white papers on this, what's known as our eco-regional maps. Now this is eco-region level three. There's a level four that gets even more specific or Doug Tallamy, if you've heard of him, Nature's Best Hope, he uses the level one, so a broader swath of our region. But what this is showing you, because we all, um, Granby as well, is in eco-region 59, Go Eco Region 59, trying to make it the coolest thing, just like we all learned our watersheds, or maybe some of us were still learning our watersheds. Now we can all learn our eco region. What it says from a seed and a plant perspective is the genetics that are collected within Eco 59 can be distributed throughout Eco Region 59. And you can know, genetically speaking, from the wild types, we're putting the right plants in the right place, which creates a seed shed, right? So we have watersheds. Now we have seed sheds. We wanna be collecting, growing, and sharing our seed all within that same region. So what's the problem? Well, there's all these different industries that work in um, 
landscaping, wildlife habitat reclamation, all of these, you know, ecological restoration folks, uh, they all want, they all want to be working with ecotypic seed. But as you can see with these red dots, those are all people that use native seed that say they can't find ecotypic seed locally, right? They want to use it, but they can't find it. And the closest place is 400 miles and the next closest place is 800 miles. So predominantly when we're putting in native pollinator plants um, in the Northeast, we're buying it from the Midwest. And as we've talked about, that's adapted to different climates, different soils, different pests. Like think about Haiti, it's the same sort of thing. We want to be making sure we're maintaining the purity of our wild corridors. So like I was doing in Idaho, this is just a funny um, idea of, of saying, you know, just like in the art history world, we want to know the provenance of where things come from. Now let's have that conversation around seed. Just like with the local food movement, we all wanted to start to know our farmers and have food becoming more locally. Now let's do that with our native plants and with nurseries. So this seed collection form allows you to have a provenance data sheet for the seeds that you're collecting. Okay, so the Ecotype Project says, we need to amplify the amount of truly local native, now you know the word ecotypic, an ecotype just is referencing those truly local wild genetics of place, right? The, the, the seeds that have been growing in our soil since time immemorial, the heirlooms of our entomological, you know, pollinator bug friends, right? It's what they've been caretaking and stewarding on the riparian corridors and around forever. We want to make sure we safeguard and make that available. How do we do that? The Society of Ecological Restoration has, you know, a great framework for making seed supply chains that we've adapted here to the Northeast. So it starts with um, botanists who collect native wild seed, utilizing those regenerative sustainable practices that I talked about with the Seeds of Success. Then I go and find organic farmers who grow out 200 of each of those species that we wild collect um, because it's illegal to take seed directly from the wild to sell it. And what we're not promoting is that everyone interested in this goes and collects from the last wild stands we really have in the Northeast. We wanna make sure that's done by really trained professionals. Um, and then we go back and collect the seed from the organic farmers and our nursery growers will grow that out and then make that available to land trusts and gardeners and homeowners. And then that's, you know, fortifying our ecological corridors and the pollinators thrive and everybody's happy. So what we've done over the past three years of this project is there's Jordy Elkins of Highstead. He's our lead botanist. He's looking actually at Spartina because at some point um, with more funding as we can bring more species on, we want to look at these coastal halophytes, the salt tolerant ones to help um, promote habitat on our coastal areas. Um, so that's a salt grass. That's really beautiful. And then you can see the hickories, which is, um, the farm of our executive director, Dina Brewster in Ridgefield, Connecticut, just a 45 acre organic, beautiful farm where they have 17 species of founder plots. We have, um, about 11 farms that are now within our project. And now you can see seed collecting, then those seeds being propagated out and then them starting to germinate at our nurseries and then making the pollinators very happy. So we've worked with a ton of farms, you know, um, even, um, or especially in urban areas, because what you wanna make sure is where you plant these founder plots have isolation distances from other wild populations you may have on your land. So actually urban environments end up being um, the, some of the perfect places for seed production because often there are not other wild stands within, you know, a largely um, pavemented, I don't know if that's the right word, <laughs> area. And so this is a great project in New Hallville. Um, and yeah, we have farmers throughout the state growing out these crops. We want to make sure that we're growing crops that bloom throughout the seasons. I heard this wonderful woman from the South one time say, it's like inviting guests over for a week and only feeding them on Monday, y'all. She's like, we got to make sure we feed them from early spring, midsummer, you know, all through fall. You want to make sure you have varying bloom times. Um, these are the species that we currently have in production at the Ecotype Project. Uh, very exciting. See some yarrows and uh, milkweeds, joe pieweeds, 
foxglove. It's just beautiful. You know, people often have that bias that native plants are messy and all of these different various things. But if we put our bug eyes on, it's truly beautiful to um, see these living seed banks, right? This is now we've talked about those other versions of seed conservation, but this is the best one. This is in situ, in the soil. This is um, the living seed banks that are adapting to the different pests, the beneficial insects, the climates. They have the greatest arcs of diversity. You know, those seed banks that are, um, you know, up in Norway and those different places are imperative resources, but sometimes they're compared to like dusty books, right? Where you want this really vigorous, really viable seed. That's the best option. Uh, ideally in those, in those ex situ seed banks, you want to be growing out that seed every three years, but surprisingly, there are not a lot of people helping to fund those initiatives and they barely have enough money to keep the lights on. And so to be able to do those regrowths is um, really quite taxing. And it's something that should have more funding and more attention put to it. So um, the symphony of ecology is just extraordinary. I mean, when you're walking through those founder plots, you're seeing insects that you never knew existed. There's these little caterpillar ones that put petals on their back to camouflage. And it's just, it's extraordinary. I'm learning so much. I certainly don't know as much entomologically as I do carpologically or with seed, but it is so fun to see. Um, these are some great photos by Abby Townsend and Jean Linville, who are the main founder plot farmers at the Hickories in Ridgefield. And um, you can see the, the Monarda, the wild bergamot, those beautiful yarrow flowers, the white ones, the, some milkweeds, just beautiful. With the Rebecca her guide Susan, um, the farmers, they were saying, you know, we don't really see any pollinators on these. Like what's going on with that? And one night they put on their red headlamps and they went out and looked at it at night and lo and behold, they're the night pollinators. So how cool is that? So not only are there different pollinators that are visiting your founder plots throughout the, throughout the seasons, but also throughout the day. So it is just talk about a real safari. It's right in your own backyard. So now we move on to actually harvesting the seed. So here's Joe Pieweed, right? And we can kind of see it going through its um, morphological and phen phenological um, changes. And um, you can see it blooming and then starting to senesce and going to seed. Down in that right-hand corner where it kind of looks a little moldy, that's a little bit too late for seed collection. We'll let that be for the birds and for, for, other, for other folks and four-leggeds, but not, not for our purposes, but um, which brings to a good question. All right, we might be harvesting these seeds, but as we bring on new farmers, how the heck do we grow these seeds? So on the Ecotype Project website, on the bottom, free as downloadable PDFs, we do have them printed out for our farmers in those old like eight by five card catalogs. Um, eight by five, is that the right dimension? Okay, well, basically it tells you where to plant them, who its beneficial allies are, what type of soil they like and so forth. So here you have the beautiful New York ironweed and then you can see that going into its pom-pom beautifulness. And you can tell when seeds are ready to harvest when you could just easily pluck them off. Nature has so many different dispersal mechanisms and one of them often used by a lot of native plants is animockery, dispersal by wind. So as soon as you could kind of blow on them and they would blow away, you know those seeds are perfectly ripe because seeds are fruit. And so they all have their perfect peak ripeness. And for best germination and viability, that's when you'd wanna be harvesting them. So this helps to show you, you kind of have to be Sherlock Holmes or whatever the female version of that is. Um, this helps you know, okay, that's the size of the seed brilliantly on graph paper by Jean Linville. This is what it looks like. This is when you can kind of think um, to harvest it. Uh, there's also seed stratification, right? Which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, which mimics these seeds to be able to grow, right? If you think about native seed, they fall into the soil. Then it has to go through that rain, freeze, rain, thaw, right? That's what it's been naturally adapted to go through. So if you want these seeds to germinate, you either have to mimic that in your fridge or do something called winter sowing, which I'll show you briefly. Um, I told you we were going to cover a lot of information, <laughs> um, but I hope you're all still with me here because um, you can see after we've harvested the seed, we just harvest them into paper bags, let it dry out, desiccate. You want to make sure all that water content's been dried out of your seeds before you try to clean them. 
just use good old car mats, rub off that pappus, which is that fluffy part that makes them fly in the wind. So we, um, these are, you know, the sieves used in soil scientists. We do, we clean it, we collect, we, we collect it, we clean it, then we store it cool, dark and dry. We do that stratification and then we germinate. So hand cleaning takes a long time. And under our USDA specialty crop block grant that the Ecotype project works under, we got this cool looking machine, which might look like DIY from Home Depot, but actually there's a beautiful hopper on top that you put your seeds in. It modulates wind flow. It's able to blow off the chaff, which is like that papery non-seed stuff or lighter non-viable seed. And then that bucket that's closest um, to those uh, screens that you can see, that's where your really viable seed drops into. So this machine has been made available to all CT NOFA, Northeast Organic Farming Association members. As again, we try to promote bioregional seed and seed sheds. Um, so after all of that work and getting the botanists and the farmers and the collection and cleaning, here you have it, my friends. We have Eco Region 59 organic, ecotypic native pollinator seed. It's a lot of words, but what it is is truly amazing. And now when we're doing ecological restoration, we can know that we're putting the right plants in the right place and we're planting for what our friends the pollinators want so eco 59 is the farmer-led seed collective that came out of the ecotype project and for the first time these seeds are commercially available and it's still not to do winter sowing so if you visit eco59.com um, hopefully you can put that in the chat when we do questions all you have to do well I'm the easiest way to winter sow and again, this image comes from the Wild Seed Project that makes a beautiful publication that makes all of these fun and complicated things I'm breezing over um, really digestible and, and beautifully illustrated. Um, you take your seed, you can sow it outside in a pot, cover it with a little bit of sand because some of these seeds need some light to germinate. It's a special sand, not just off the beach, just a clean sand. You can cover it with a, a bit of um, wire so that birds and chipmunks and other things don't eat it. Then you let it get snowed on, rained on, let nature do its thing. You might want to put an east facing part of your house so that it doesn't get so, so much sun. Um, and then in spring, when the seeds are ready, it'll start popping up. And this actually tends to have a better germination rate than when you put it in like um, a moist paper towel in a Ziploc in your fridge. If you want to learn more about winter sowing with as much as we're covering tonight, just look up on YouTube, native seed winter sowing, and there's plenty of great instructional videos that can teach you more about this. Um, in an effort to help spread the seed and spread the fun of all this work, I started boattanical.org because I say, I'm not a botanist, I'm a boatnist. There's nothing I love more than paddling down a river and nothing I love more than paddling down a river with native plants. So we paddle down the Quinnetiquette, which is the Algonquian word for the long tidal river it goes Orders of Canada down to Long Island Sound. And what we did is we got into Eco Region 59. We planted these ecotypic native plants back along the riparian corridor. So, other fun mechanisms of sea dispersal, hydrochery by water, anthropochery by humans. You know, we all have a role to play in the caretaking and stewardship of our lands. And when we put these seeds back in the living seed bank, nature is going to help proliferate them. Even Mermockery, dispersal of seed by ants. I mean, how cool is that? Ornithockery? I could go on. I digress. Um, this was this year's expedition. The first year we went from the John Ledyard Canoe Club at Dartmouth. He was a really cool guy. I encourage you to look up his biography um, to the Massachusetts border. And this year we went from the top of Connecticut um, all the way down to Long Island Sound. Holly, I know you were at the Hartford um, Flower Show. We stopped at the Connecticut Science Center and made native seed balls. Those are those really fun seed balls you can gorilla garden and throw other places with kids and planted a new founder pot at Forest City Farms in Middletown and um, sailed on a boat out of the Essex um, Historical Society. And it's just so fun to, you know, take your friends, take some native plants and uh, go on an expedition. I'm honored to carry the Wings World Quest um, expedition flag with me. That's the leading organization supporting women in science. And um, it's just, you know, in this time of the pandemic, it, 
you don't need to go on a plane to the Himalayas to go on an expedition. You can go right in your backyard. And often that's the place where stewardship is needed most. So I encourage you to maybe plan something fun like that and grab a paddle and grab some plants and grab some permission too, because you do need permission to put plants places. Um, finally, on this great expedition, I want to tell you about my hometown where I'm from. I'm from the Greens Farms, Southport area. And um, this area used to be known as the onion capital of the world. So here is the Southport Globe onion. It was prized for its storage ability. We had the best seed houses. We grew the best seed. Everyone was an onion person. You can see these vast onion fields kind of where a lot of the wealth in our area first originated from. And um, each Thursday they would drive their huge harvest down to these sloops that would sail them along the Long Island Sound, kind of the original transport way by water to the New York City markets. You know, young boys would hop on the sailboats and go have fun for the weekend and come back. Just this great history. But then, like what happened in Samoa in 1994 with Taro, um, at the end of the um, 1880s, or just before the 1900s, um, there was this uh, smut, this blight that wiped out all the onion production. And all of these warehouses became speakeasies. Um, yes, you're famous for the seed, but um, they became speakeasies that the likes of, you know, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and his lovely wife were uh, Zelda were partying at during prohibition. So it went from onions to, to booze and what Connecticut's re very well known for now with the, the partying and the socializing. But, um, you know, as the seed hunters, I said, I really want our town to be invested in seed saving. How can I get them excited? And I can't, you know, this onion is so delicious. I can't believe it was lost. So I went on a, a seed huntress mission to find the seed and Baker Creek Heirloom Seed was still maintaining that variety, but they'd been growing it out in Ohio for, you know, 130 years. So I got seed from them. Here's the beautiful flower head. Allium sepa, that pom-pom, so gorgeous. Um, and I got that seed and I said, I'm welcoming this Allium heirloom home. Jokingly, the Allium Anati. I know that's not that funny. But um, so what we did is we put the seeds back in Southport soil. This is at the Autobahn where they did this huge native bird um, habitat restoration project. Got my friends to help. You can see the little baby onion seeds. The dogs helped and there are the onions. But the interesting thing is, is that onions are biennials. So to have them go to seed, you have to take these out and then replant these bulbs. And the second year is when you get these seed heads. So after 130 years, ta-da, we've done it. The seed is back. And this is just a funny video of me saying, welcome back seeds. Um, and I was able to, you know, bring the joy and love of seeds to my local alma mater, to Greens Farms Academy. I was able to um, get these kids all super inspired. Sorry, just one second. Um, um, I was able to get all of these kids really excited about it. They were drawing pictures. They were becoming onion farmers. We even had an onion festival. And of course you need a bagpiper. And so you can see all of the young kids and everyone dancing as the onion has been welcomed back to our great soils. Um, articles were written about it. We really just got everyone excited, but how are we gonna share it? Dun, dun, dun. We started a seed library. So seed libraries are so, so cool. For everything that we've talked about when you want bioregional local seed, what a seed library does is it makes seeds available for free. You sign them out like you would sign out a book and then you would grow out your seeds in your garden with the hope that after you grow them back out, you save a little bit that you let go to seed. And there's that great book, Seed to Seed by Susan Ashworth, which I also saw Holly has by her side. So I think it's locally available to all you in Granby. And that teaches you how to save seeds from a number of different species. But what we did with um, the Southport Globe Onion Seed is we put it available for free in our seed library. So everyone throughout the town was able to go check out their own onion seed and grow it. And so now there are so many folks that are growing this seed all over Southport again. So seed libraries are such 
extraordinary resources and make sharing the biodiversity and bounty of your yard so easy and accessible and talk about creating a seed shed and just beautiful community. Um, and, um, you know, as my great mentor, Bill McDormand said, who has the Roth Mountain Seed Alliance where they teach seed school, which is now online if you wanna go take it. He says, we are the people of the pinch. We're at a pinch of time in our genetic seed biodiversity where we can either watch the great erosion of it all wash away, or we can stand in as stewards and caretakers of these beautiful seeds. So um, with that, I say, I am gonna turn this back over to Holly because I think she has a really exciting announcement about that last little factoid. And then I'll be really excited to take some questions. Thanks, Holly. Absolutely, you're welcome. Thank you, Alex. Oh my God, Sephra, that was just like, that was fantastic. I mean, I picked up a lot of fun facts and interesting things I'd never knew about. So thank you. Thank you for all your good works with seeds. This is really tremendous. Um, so before we get too far off seeds, um, we, Sephra, she's correct. We do have a really um, fun and exciting announcement to make for the people in our area. Um, the card catalog at the Frederick H. Cossett Library has been repurposed as a seed catalog. And we're excited to invite um, everyone from the community to come and check out the brand new Cossett Library seed catalog at the Cossett Library in North Granby. Um, for those of you who are already visiting us, you know that the library in North Granby is open on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. And we are very excited to welcome you all next Tuesday, March 1st at 3 p.m. for our grand opening of our seed library. And so I don't know if we're as sophisticated yet as our, as our great, our wonderful onion down at Southport and all that, but we're hoping to introduce more programming throughout the spring and summer and fall about seed saving. Um, we do have a number of books in the library and we have access to lots more. So for those of you who are super serious about um, jumping on this um, great project, we are welcome welcome the participation. And we'd of course like to start saving some seeds so that we can get them back into our seed library at Cossett um, later on in the season. Um, again, or I like to say the seeds in. All of my seed. jokes are like lame. No, that's great. I'm gonna have to snag some of those and use Dang those. It. Yeah. Um, it, it's exciting. We're, I mean, we've had several staff working very diligently on packaging and labeling our seeds. So we're real excited about it. Um, I also wanna uh, mention that um, the folks that show up um, next week, uh, while supplies last, there'll be fun little giveaways to take home um, with your seeds. So definitely um, come and visit us. Maybe don't all show up at three o'clock on Tuesday, maybe space yourselves out a little bit, but um, we were, the staff are super excited and I am too. And we're really looking forward to um, having this seed library be a really um, interesting part, a special collection for the library. So um, there'll be more information about it posted on our website very soon. Um, we've been holding back because we wanted to make this special announcement tonight when we had this wonderful program opportunity. So um, you'll be able to see lots more about the Seed Library on our website in the next couple of days. And of course, we're also going to um, take more questions in a minute, but I want to um, end the recording now at this point, and you'll be able to find this recording on the Granby Public Library YouTube channel. So let me just